that's why venture capital is so dope is because it's always at the cutting edge. So to take the cutting edge and then teach that and instill that into the youth. Oh my God. Now back up again, instill that into the diverse and minority youth that historically never gets that information. Oh my God. <laughs> We have candid conversations on running a venture capital firm, as well as investing in founders, planning for profits around a purpose, and making a positive impact through entrepreneurship. I'm Naveen Goyal, your host and the CEO of Loud Capital here in Columbus, Ohio. Today's episode is talking about the young folks, the young folks entering the venture capital world, the young folks having the ability to mold the venture capital world. And it's about listening to the young folks. So I have Ryan Retcher, my partner and CEO at Loud Capital, as well as a special guest, David Malloy, one of the associates here at Loud. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm just going to jump right in. And so, David, first of all, you are our first Gen Zer on the show. So I want to say congratulations for not only being the first one, but uh, no pressure. You know, tell us about your background. Uh, well, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. I started in the music industry when I was in high school. I was a ghostwriter at one of the studios that Epic Records owned. So I would Ooh. go up there on Saturdays and write music. My parents were like, that's not going to make you any money, so go to college. So my mom lives up here in Ohio. So I came up here, went to Ohio State. Wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I thought I wanted to be an artist and that I wasn't going to have a major. I was just going to graduate undecided. I realized early on that leaving Atlanta, Georgia for Columbus, Ohio might not have been the best idea if I wanted to be a music artist. So I kind of just took a pause and said, okay, what do I care about? And that came down to two things, making a good amount of money and helping people. Super unapologetic about the first one because I mean, hey, <laughs> I just want to make money. But at the same it, time, yeah. Yeah. you know, you got to uh, help people around you. So I looked at the resources I had around me. I was in the business school at Ohio State at the time. And they, you know, gave me all the different resources I needed to like really see where I wanted to go. And I ultimately chose finance as my major because I was super interested in nonprofits helping people. Yeah. So I did that for a while, did nonprofits and uh, social entrepreneurship. And that's actually how I found my way here at Allowed. I was networking, talking to business owners in the Columbus area, hearing their stories, you know, honestly just falling in love with entrepreneurship. And eventually I came along to Ryan Retcher uh, by way of Eric Troy. He introduced us and um, Ryan and I sat down, had a conversation. At the time, I thought venture capital was... Uh, and actually, you know what? Um, before we jump in, actually, there, there's a lot that you just said that to me is really interesting. Grew up in Atlanta and you end up in Columbus, Ohio. So you, you told us why you came to Columbus. But give me your perspective on growing up in Atlanta and landing in Columbus. And you had mentioned something about, I'm not sure why that happened, but but tell me, you know, explain to people what what the differences were when you just opened up your eyes and you were interacting with people or observing something about the city or the culture, uh, give, you know, it, because people might not be familiar with Atlanta or Columbus. So just give us a perspective. Yes. I mean, add a little bit of color to that. I grew up in South Fulton. It's on the South side of Atlanta, outside of the perimeter, uh, for people that know, uh, you have 285, which is, uh, inside the perimeter then outside of 285 is outside. I was outside. It's still, it's not rural, but everything's spread out. A lot of trees everywhere. You always feel connected. Everybody knows everybody. I didn't speak about it and I usually don't, but I got connected with people through painting shoes. That was actually my first entrepreneurial uh, endeavor. Painting uh, shoes. Yeah. So I used to customize and uh, restore. So Ooh. like, uh, like if you ever saw online, like where people made shoes look like Yeezys with like the bottoms that glow and like the black and then the red inners, I, I was doing stuff like that. Wow. Um, but I would also clean and restore and I'd flip too. And eventually I saved up enough money to start buying music equipment. And that's really how I got into music. So um, you had a little entrepreneurial spirit very early on. What, what, yeah. When did you start uh, painting the shoes? I started painting shoes when I was 14. And I probably stopped doing it for money when I was about 17. Okay. All right. So entrepreneurial spirit already started kind of flipping shoes. Yep. Right. Yep. 
liked music, got into it. Parents said, okay, no, this is not a career you can follow. You need to, you need to do something quote unquote grown up yep. and you end up in Columbus. Yeah. So, I mean, to give Columbus a little bit more color, I did want to go to business school. I just didn't know what I wanted to do. And I applied to business schools all across the country. You know, uh, I went and toured UCLA. I toured uh, Cornell, even toured Georgia Tech in Atlanta. Uh, actually, actually have a pretty good business school. But, you know, at the end of the day, Ohio State just felt like home because my mom lives up here. Yeah. Um, and I would visit her over the summers. And, you know, I don't know. I've always been a Buckeye fan. So I was like, hey, why not? You know, good school. So visiting um, as you were growing up, your mom was here. But coming to Ohio State on campus as a student, did you feel like, hey, this is very different from what I thought? Oh, my God. Culture shock. Like, honestly, going to college at a PWI um, is culture shock 101. You know, coming from Atlanta, Georgia. I don't know if you've ever flown into the uh, Atlanta, Georgia, Atlanta airport. Yeah. Hartsfield, but yeah. like whenever you go in, it's like just a sea of black people. Yep. And for me, it's almost euphoric to just be around that. It's like, ah, I'm home. Um, you get the exact opposite of that when you walk around Ohio State's campus. It's literally just a sea of white yeah. with a few speckles of black. I mean, to my knowledge, I, I believe there's a 2% black population at Ohio State right now. So that is somewhere around 1,000 to like 3,000 students, which is actually pretty big compared to uh, some HBCUs. But we're so spread out because the campus is so big and there's just so much stuff going on. So it was a little overwhelming at first, but I feel like I adjusted pretty well. Got it. And so when it comes to landing in Atlanta, obviously you said it's a sea of black and I've been there multiple times and I totally uh, see that observation, but are there other cities that exist like Atlanta that big that you would feel that way? Or is Atlanta, that, I know it's, it's special. I know there's a lot of culture there, but um, as a naive person who hasn't traveled to every city in this country, are there other cities that you would feel like that? That's a really good question. Honestly, I don't think so. The only other cities that I've personally been to that are like that are maybe Houston, Texas and Memphis, Tennessee. Got it. That's all that I, those are the only ones I know of. Okay. All right. So now you're in a sea of white. You're in a very large campus and you're studying business. Yes, sir. Yeah. So then tell me about you know, your aspirations, like did venture capital or, you know, formally entrepreneurship in the sense of starting a business, did that enter your mind as a end goal? You know, entrepreneur in the form of one day owning my own music label was uh, an aspiration of mine. I definitely wanted to be an investor, not necessarily in the private markets, but more so on the real estate side. So I guess I had that understanding. But as I was saying earlier, uh, in my first conversation with Ryan, Venture capital, I thought you put in a dollar and you got back a billion. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's your perspective before you look at really dig into venture capital. It's really like, hey, we invest money, we make a crap load of money. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And I'll, I'm just going to you know, ask Ryan here, since you were the first one to have a conversation with David over here, especially with regards to the Loud organization. Give me your impression of, or if you have a memory of when you first met David. Yeah, well, I first met David uh, at a tailgate party. Uh, so that, that was cool. Just, uh, being able to connect with, with you, uh, on a more personal level. Um, and then I think a couple of weeks later, as you mentioned, uh, uh, ET, uh, got us, got us in a room to, to, to talk and, uh, just had a, a lot of great things to, to, to say about you and, uh, your spirit. And we, we've had a lot of college age students, you know, uh, come into our organization and, that's one area that we've, I think, had success in and is is attracting, you know, really talented and passionate people in that space. And um, one of the things that, you know, I, I can't remember anything specific about the first meeting, but one thing that I've appreciated about you, David, over time, we've traveled together, um, gone to Atlanta a lot, you know, gone to places like Morehouse and uh, Russell Center for Innovation uh, and Entrepreneurship down there and uh, just was an opportunity for us to learn a lot. And I felt like you were our guide in, uh, in, in culture. And so I've always appreciated, especially as you've gotten to know venture and traditional venture more, you've been, uh, you've, you've graduated from Venture University, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, sir. 
David and I have a lot of uh, sparring conversations, <laughs> if you will, uh, on traditional venture versus our, our blend of, of venture. And I think uh, I know those are learning experiences for, for, for me as well. But uh, one thing that I, I appreciate the most about you, David, is that you're, you're always willing to uh, share your perspective on both your generation and kind of connect the dots for, for us, for everyone that's around you. And you do it in such a eloquent way. Um, Thank you. that, that it's, it's, um, it's hard not to listen to you. Um, but as I, I don't know, I'm when I was born, I'm this in between generation. So I'm, I'm like not quite a millennial, not quite gen X. And I'm in this weird spot where I can kind of relate to both, but not really. And, uh, you know, David's really been just a guy. Well, I have good news. I'm, old, but I can relate to everybody. So we're all good here, but we got to We got to unwrap this for a second. There is, you know, healthy, let's call it debate. I love the word debate because I think it encourages different opinions and the goal is to discuss it. Right. Right. What have you debated on? And David, you tell me on what you see venture as, or what it can be. Do you have something in mind that you have had a debate with Ryan about? Because I think this is the stuff that we should talk about, right? Number one, what was your perspective of venture before and what is it now? Has it changed? I I would 100% say it's changed. Like I said, when I first saw venture, (laughs) I thought it was honestly just this big monolith of uh, white guys that Mm -hmm. like really just flip money. You know, when I was in school, um, in high school, I flipped shoes. They would flip companies. Yeah. You know, Uh, so it, it made sense from that perspective. But a nod to Loud, honestly, the reason I really considered Loud at the time was because I believe it was what, 40% of the portfolio was minority or women led. That really spoke to me. And it was like, it it made me like, wait a minute, they're actually investing in black and brown people. Okay. Let me like actually pay attention to this. (laughs) So I think um, in the beginning, that was one of my very first experiences with venture capital. So thank you guys for showing me the possibility of that. I think today I see venture capital for maybe not necessarily what it is, but also what it can be. And to me, I feel like venture capital is honestly going to become like the public markets. Right now, we just don't have that transparency and we don't have that speed, but it's coming. Yeah. Because you have people um, like Lau, honestly, that are going out there and explaining stuff to people. What was it last week? We had a um, like just a conversation with uh, potential investors in Dublin. Yep. Where we were just educated. It wasn't even like yeah. pushing loud. We were just having a conversation. So. Yeah. It was actually uh, a handful of women executives who felt like they have not been taken seriously or heard. Many times it's, hey, let me talk to your spouse about investments. So we had uh, a small private event where these women were, uh, according to them, felt comfortable asking questions and learning about venture capital. So for me personally, that was very fulfilling. And that's, you know, I, that's where I started out where I wanted to know more about venture capital. So we want to continue to do things um, like that. We want to continue to do this podcast to talk about these things. Uh, and then addressing what you said about loud and, and how you're, you're happy to be a part of the team and, and the opportunity. I will also say, you know, Darshan and myself were the two co-founders of loud capital. We're two brown guys. We're Indian Americans starting a VC firm back in 2015. So when we started and we were raising capital and we started looking around, we also felt that way. We also felt like this is a very closed circuit of a lot of wealthy white males. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I grew up in the suburbs with a, a very similar composition. So it wasn't like oh my gosh, this is, you know, I I didn't feel uncomfortable, but now we were into a new industry where it's dominated by it. And it's already intimidating to start a company. It's already intimidating to raise capital. It's already intimidating to be an entrepreneur. And now you're like, wow, I'm going against the grain in so many ways. But what that did for us, uh, it helped us grow. It expanded our mindset. And then the, the secret that no one wants to talk about is how powerful venture capital is. To raise capital and to decide where to invest capital is very powerful. And who you invest in, the communities you invest in, is extremely uplifting and empowering. 
So when we realized that very early on, we said we have to do better than just the crazy stats of a lot of um, the white males and, and barely any females in this country that we're invested in. So you're saying thanks to loud, David, but I'm actually saying we're actually creating and molding this together and hopefully we can be more influential to other firms and other people who are looking into the space. Because to your point, I do agree that venture capital is not going away. It's just getting more attention. There's a sexiness to it. There's a creative mindset to it. And um, as it becomes more mainstream, we have the opportunity to mold it. 100%. So I'm just excited to have you here. I mean, you know, if you're a, a, a young person out there who's, let's say, in business school as an undergrad, right? doesn't matter who you are, where you are geographically, excite them. Excite them right now about venture capital if you don't know much about it. How do you get people to be really interested in it? I would say I get people interested by the fact that it's always changing and that no one can really predict where it's changing. So there's always going to be an opportunity. Sequoia, um, Sequoia Capital just released that they're changing their entire fund structure. They just turned the entire thing on its head. They went from saying, okay, we're only investing in early stage to late stage companies to saying, no, we're going to invest in everything. We're going to set it up like a college endowment. And we're going to invest from the earliest stages, the very first check in a company to investing in the public markets. That's never been done before. And it's because that, that's what venture capital is. It keeps changing. It keeps evolving. So I think that's the most exciting thing for me. Like you may feel like, oh, I don't have enough knowledge or, oh, I don't know enough stuff. There's so much information online and things are changing so quick that you can honestly become a thought leader by just looking at everything, saying, hmm, what do I think about this and putting it out there? That's what's most exciting to me about venture capital. So I would say us three embrace change, right? That's why we're here. We thrive on it. We embrace it. We look forward to it. In fact, we wouldn't be here if there wasn't change constantly. But well, Ryan, how do you talk to someone who's listening out there who is very afraid of change and says, wait, it's changing rapidly? That's actually very scary to me. How do you talk to that person about change? Yeah, I, I think it's a nature of getting them to recognize that the world around them is changing on a daily basis, regardless, and that in day to day, we tend to embrace it because it's the norm. Uh, especially over the last 15 years as technology has compounded and compounded over and over again at the most aggressive rate we've seen since the dawn of humanity. I just say, look around you, look how you're adapting to that change around you on a day-to-day -day basis and look for ways on how you could rethink how you approach business, how you approach um, things that you're passionate about that you want to do. And if you have a hitch about diving into that because it's change, then just look at how you adapt to everything else and, and think, okay, this can't be that bad. What, what would happen if I tried this? And I think just diving in is really the, the key because that's what we do. Yeah. That's what we all do. And I think, you know, if I'm talking to my 11 and 13 year old daughters right now, it is. And, and if they said the same thing, hey, change is scary. Well, it's really, OK, how can we help you learn to adapt to the change? Because like you said, the last 15 years with technology accelerating just in crazy amount of change and progress and all the other things, good, good and bad. But in the end, that is life right now. Life is changing more dramatically than it ever has. And we as humans need to embrace it. And it can be scary, but scary is okay. Scary can push you forward or it can put you in a corner and, and help, you know, make you hide. But I think it's our job as parents, adults, respected members in society, whatever we want to call us, to help people not hide, but to try to embrace the change in their own way. 100%. I think um, accept the change in their own way. I'm so glad you said that because as you were speaking, I was thinking of authenticity that is how you make it through change. Like being true to yourself. That's actually my personal motto, be true to yourself. It, it's good and bad because when it's 11 o'clock at night and I should be eating something healthy, I say, be true to yourself, what would you eat? <laughs> but also, I mean, like whenever I'm deciding like what I wear or how I look, you know, I mean, I dyed my hair and people ask me, why'd you dye your hair pink? Like, why'd, why'd you dye your hair blonde? For the longest, I was like, oh, I don't know. I mean, I just felt like it. 
But honestly, it's to live in my truth. That's just who I am. I see myself as a person um, who has pink hair, who has blonde hair. Yeah. Period. And that's how you make it through change because the world around you may change, but you're always going to be you. The fun part is discovering who you are through the change. So that's good. That's really good. And so when we're talking about, uh, you know, we're talking about change, we're talking about venture capital and it, you know, it being constantly changing. Tell me what are some things in the future you're excited about outside of being more in the public, you know, eyes and, and more people involved. What else? Like, why is venture capital important to you? And, you know, being true to yourself, you're obviously part of this organization. Well, what feels really right and true to you? Investing in black people. Got it. Honestly and truly investing in black people. I mean, coming from Atlanta, Georgia, and just seeing all the ideas <laughs> that we come up with just on like a whim, you know, and it's like, it, it's so funny because it's just like, oh, we're having a conversation about something. Like you and I, we were just talking about propofol. Yeah. It low-key has nothing to do with this, but it also has everything to do with this in the sense that when you use propofol, it's only for anesthesiologists and it's when someone is going under or you're putting, you're sedating somebody. The same way with venture capital, like it's the beginning stage. But when you wake somebody up, you can't use propofol. You have to use something totally different and it's a totally different process. The same thing with investing. It's a totally different process. Now, let's back up for a second. That entire thought process. I just came up with that on the, on a whim. Yeah. And I feel like that's something that's very integral to Black people in the sense that we just have these ideas that don't get the shine because we don't necessarily tailor them in a way that's acceptable. And the only way that we'll be able to get our ideas invested in, our businesses invested in, is if we have Black and brown people on the other side of the table. We need Black people investing in Black people. Got it. And th- that's awesome, by the way. Everything you just said. And by the way, you're a young disciple in anesthesia, by the way, because you're using propofol, <laughs> you're talking about all these things. So w- let me take it one step further. Outside of the investor side looking like us, right? What else could be done differently to invest in Black people, in your opinion? Uh, you know, I think that's why I love venture capital, because the education that you can bring And like, there's just so many resources behind venture capital. Like we could go to schools and teach people about financial literacy. But when I say financial literacy, I don't just mean like your typical, oh, this is a savings account. No, this is a checking account. I mean, like understanding um, DAOs, like decentralized autonomy or decentralized anonymous organizations, understanding how you can leverage those, understanding how you can build those and like create wealth for your community, you know? That's why venture capital is so dope is because it's always at the cutting edge. So to take the cutting edge and then teach that and instill that into the youth. Oh, my God. Now, back up again. Instill that into the diverse and minority youth that historically never gets that information. Oh, my God. That is just if that doesn't excite you, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. No. and, And just to add on to that, it's it's the educational component and it's strategically getting to communities. And so I'm going to, I'm going to say that again, strategically get into communities from the investor side. Right now, there's a lot of venture capital firms and institutions that basically get deal flow by their own networks or their own circle. And if your circle isn't very diverse, or if your circle does, is not represented from various communities, how does someone from that community get in front of you for a potential investment? And that's where we are constantly thinking about how do we get more folks from various communities? And there's there's no answer at the moment, at least that, that I have, but it's really constantly revisiting of what has not worked, what has worked. And when I say we, by the way, I, I, I'm representing loud, but also hopefully the venture capital industry of how we can do better. I know more people are talking about it, but these are kind of things I want to share with, with whoever's listening to, you know, if you have ideas, we would love to hear how we reach other communities. We've traveled across the country the last couple of years, met with various different communities. We've heard a lot um, of great people and great entrepreneurs. I think that's already a, kind of a step that a lot of people aren't taking. Some people are like, well, thanks for visiting. And uh, we, we have a lot of great people in this community, but we don't know how to contact investors. So some of it's just connecting, listening, right? Exactly. I just having that conversation, you know, that's why I love what we do here at Loud in terms of like reaching out to the community, you know, our internship program, like 
the, the answer to your question earlier, how do we connect to people in these communities is just to do the work, get out there and talk to them. Like we just hired two interns. Um, one is a woman and one, one is an Indian. I got out there and talked to them. I talked to the Indian club. I talked to the women entrepreneurs at OSU. You know, that, that's how you do it. The words of pride. We're going out and meeting people in their communities. That's really the only way, you know? Yeah. But if you do that, if you invest those resources, the ROI is like off the charts. So, so committing to resources for boots on the ground. Yes, sir. That? That's a great way to put it. That's a much more concise way to put it. However big your firm is, however small your firm is, successful, older, younger firm, doesn't matter. Always have boots on the ground, listening to what's going on, being able to have ways of communication and dialogue, two ways, and continuously infusing that into your company and culture to constantly be better. I think when we stop doing that as a company, that's when you're not only antiquated, but you're dead. And, and that's how I think we judge ourselves here in, in this room. But first of all, I want to say this was a, a good conversation. I'm going to wrap this up because it's really about having candid conversations about venture capital, the business behind it, the strategy behind it, the people behind it, right? And I, I want to thank you, David, for first being our uh, first young gentleman on the show, but also expressing from a standpoint of a generation that we want to continue to hear from and we want to continue to see the molding and structuring of this new, hopefully, venture capital industry in a more positive, impactful way. So I want to thank you, Ryan and David, for being here today. Thank you for for listening. This is Naveen Goyle here in Columbus, Ohio. Always willing to listen and learn more and experience more through various eyes. And until next time.